give you a sutta tonight that's called the Honeyball Sutta. And the Honeyball Sutta has some, some things about the links of dependent origination in them. So you're going to get a little bit more every night for a little while. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living in the Sakyan country of Kapvilavatu in Negrodas Park. Then when it was morning, the Blessed One dressed, taking his bowl and outer robe, went into Kapvilavatu for alms. When he'd wandered for alms at Kapvilavatu and had returned from his alms round after his meal, he went to the great wood for his day's abiding. Entering the great wood, he sat down at the root of a bulva sapling for the day's abiding. Dandapani, the Sakyan, while walking and wandering for exercise, also went to the great wood. And then, and when he entered the great wood, he went to the bulva sapling where the Blessed One was and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he stood at one side leading on his stick. This shows that Dandapani was not respectful of the Buddha's teaching. He he knew that the Buddha was the teacher, and the teacher's head is always supposed to be higher than anybody else's. So, he asked the Blessed One, what does a recluse assert? What does he proclaim? Friend, I assert and proclaim my teaching in such a way that one does not quarrel with anyone in the world. With its gods, its maras, and its brahmas, in this generation with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and its people, in such a way that perceptions no longer underlie that brahman who abides detached from sensual pleasures, without perplexity, shorn of worry, free from craving for any kind of being. When this was said, Danjapani, the Sakyan shook his head, wagged his tongue, and raised his eyebrows until his forehead was puckered with three lines. <laughs> Then the departed one the, then he departed leaning on his stick. When it was evening the blessed one rose from meditation and went to the Negrota's park where he sat down on a seat made ready for him and told the monks what had taken place. So this tells you right there that the Buddha always didn't always sit on the ground cross legged. Quite often, he would sit on a chair, and it was made ready for him, so he didn't have to get all the way down. When this sutta was given, he was getting old. He was oh, maybe 73, 74 years old, so it was getting harder for him to get up and down, as happens. <laughs> ah, boy, does it. Uh, then a certain monk asked the Blessed One, But Venerable Sir, how does the Blessed One assert and proclaim his teachings in such a way that he does not quarrel with anyone in the world, with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas in this generation, with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and its people? And Venerable One, how is it that perceptions no more underlie the Blessed One, that Brahman who abides detached from sensual pleasures, without perplexity, shorn of worry, free from craving for any kind of being? 
Monks, as to the source through which perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation, one of my favorite words these days, besets a man, if nothing is found there to delight in, welcome and hold to, this is the end of the underlying tendency to lust of the underlying tendency to aversion, of the underlying tendency to craving, of the underlying tendency to views, of the underlying tendency to doubt, of the underlying tendency to conceit, of the underlying tendency to desire for being, of the underlying tendency to ignorance, this is the end of resorting to rods and weapons and of quarrels, brawls, disputes, recrimination, malicious words, and false speech. Here these evil and wholesome states cease without remainder. That is what the Blessed One said. Having said this, the Sublime One rose from his seat and went into his dwelling. This is where the monks that were listening to this made a mistake. Because they asked the Buddha a question, he always gave a summary of the answer. And unless they said, well, I need to hear the detailed meaning, the Buddha would get up and go away, thinking, oh, okay, they understood that. So, then soon after the Blessed One had gone, the monks considered, now friends, the Blessed One has risen from his seat and gone into his dwelling after giving a summary in brief without expounding the detailed meaning. Now, who will expound this in detail? Then they considered the Venerable Mahakachana is praised by the teacher and esteemed by his wise companions in the holy life. He is capable of expounding the detailed meaning. Suppose we went to him and asked him the meaning of this. Then the, blessed, then the monks went to the venerable Mahakachana and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one, they sat down at one side and said and, and told him what had taken place, adding, the Venerable Mahakachana, let the Venerable Mahakachana expound it to us. The Venerable Mahakachana replied, friends, it is though a man needing heartwood seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, thought that heartwood should be sought for among the branches and leaves of a great tree standing, possessed of heartwood. After he passed over the root and the trunk. And so it is with you, venerable sirs, that you think I should be asked about the meaning of this after you passed the Blessed One by, when you were face to face with the teacher, for knowing the Blessed One knows, seeing he sees, he is vision, he is knowledge, he is the Dhamma, he is the Holy One, he is the sayer, proclaimer, elucidator of meaning, the giver of the deathless, the lord of the Dhamma, the Tathagata. That was the time you should have asked the Blessed One the meaning. As he told you, you should have remembered it. Surely, friend Kachana, knowing the Blessed One knows, seeing he sees, he is vision, he is knowledge, he is the Dhamma, he is the Holy One, he is the sayer, the proclaimer, the elucidator of meaning, the giver of the deathless, the Lord of the Dhamma, the Tathagata. 
That was the time we should have asked the Blessed One the meaning. As he told us, we should have remembered it. Yet the Venerable Mahakachana is praised by the teacher and esteemed by his wise companions in the holy life. There again you have the word wise, so the, what are you talking about? He understood the length of dependent origination and how to explain them. The Venerable Mahakachana is capable of expounding in the detailed meaning of this summary given in brief by the Blessed One. Without expounding the detailed meaning, let the ma ma Venerable Mahakachana expound it without finding it too troublesome. Then listen, friends, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, vener venerable, or yes, friend. Uh, <coughs> it's a little bit confusing because during the time of the Buddha, all of the monks called each other friend. It didn't matter what the seniority was. Uh, in the Parinibbana Sutta, right before the, bear, the Buddha died, he said that now the senior monks should be called Bhante and the junior monks should be called friend, Awuso. These days, when monks address themselves, they call everybody Bhante. So it gets a little bit confusing sometimes when you hear them saying, friend, what are you doing? And now we say Bhante. So. The Venerable Mahakachana said this, Friends, when the Blessed One rose from his seat and went into his dwelling after giving a summary in brief, without expounding the detailed meaning, that is, at monks as to the source through which perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a man, if nothing is found there to delight in, welcome and hold to, this is the end of the underlying tendency to lust, the underlying tendency to aversion, the underlying tendency to craving, of the underlying tendency to views, of the underlying tendency to doubt, of the underlying tendency to conceit, of the underlying tendency to desire for being, of the underlying tendency to ignorance. This is the end of resorting to rods and weapons, of quarrels, brawls, disputes, recrimination, malicious words, and false speech. Here, these evil, unwholesome states cease without remainder. Friends, when the Blessed One rose from his seat and went into the dwelling after giving a summary in brief without expounding the detailed meaning, this is the understanding of the detailed meaning to it as follows. Dependent on the eye and forms, eye consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is eye contact. With eye contact as condition, there is eye feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. So you have a feeling with eye consciousness. And as soon as that feeling arises, there is the perception, the perceiving of this is a pleasant sight, an unpleasant sight, a neutral sight. What one perceives, that one craves. 
what one craves, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. With what one has mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a man with respect to the past, future, and present forms cognizable through the eye. What is mental proliferation saying? Mental proliferation is getting caught up in the story about. And this is where your opinions, your ideas, and the false belief in a personal self arise. Now your opinions and your ideas are not necessarily true. They can be clouded because of past attachments. Somebody that has gone through a very emotional state and kept a hold of it and kept repeating it to themselves over and over, when they forget about that, another situation that comes up that's similar is clouded because of the past mental proliferation. And that's how you cause yourself suffering. That's how you cause yourself pain. Okay. Dependent on the ear and sounds, ear consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is ear contact. That's the ear, the sound, and the consciousness, the ear consciousness. Those three together are called contact, ear contact. With ear contact as condition, there is ear feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. I like it or I don't like it. What one craves, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. With what one has mentally proliferated as the source, Perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a man with respect to the past, future, and present sounds cognizable through the ear. Dependent on the nose and odors, nose consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is nose contact. With nose contact as condition, there is nose feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. What one craves, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. So what are we talking about here? Getting caught in your own ideas, concepts, and opinions. They don't necessarily have to do with things as they truly are. Most of the time, they don't do with that. How many times you get in a, into an emotional situation and you go away from that and what do you think about? How you like this or didn't like that. How you're right and whoever you had that interaction with is wrong. What you should have said to them, but you didn't. 
So you wind up mentally proliferating and it's like it's on a tape deck. Same words, same order. That's what being attached is all about. This is showing you how this process actually works. Okay. And we'll get into how to let it go in a little while. <clears throat> With what one has mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a man. You understand that? How, how you get beset upon the suffering that you are causing yourself by your mental proliferation and opin opinions and ideas <coughs> that are clouded already because you're taking it personally. You're saying, this is me, this is the way it actually is. These are my thoughts, these are my feelings. And I'm right and they're wrong. So, when you start to see this, what do you need to do? Ah, uh, it's getting to be more and more people saying that. Good. Why? Because that's the only way that you can let go of the craving. And when you let go of the craving, there is no mental proliferation. So this is a real important thing that I'm telling you. And you hear me tell you every day, over and over. And eventually you might even hear it. So with what one has mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and no notions born of mental proliferation beset a man with respect to the past, future, and present uh, odors cognizable through the nose. This is a real short sutta except for the dot, 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 which makes it a long sutta. Dependent on the tongue and flavors, tongue consciousness arises. The meaning of the three is tongue contact. With tongue contact as condition, there is tongue feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. What one craves, that one thinks about. The very start of the false belief in a personal self is craving. Now almost all of the suttas, they make a big deal about clinging. But craving is where that false belief actually begins. I like it, I don't like it. That's what craving is. So when you use the six R's, what you see is you let go of that tension and tightness caused by that craving. And right after you l relax, there is no more thoughts. There is no mental proliferation. There is only this clear, bright, pure mind. And you bring that pure mind, and it's pure because you don't have any craving in it. It's pure and you bring that pure mind to your smile and your object to meditation. That's why a lot of you are starting to see 
that when you do this, your progress starts to get very fast. And you really start understanding, ah, this is, I, now I understand what, he, what he's talking about here. This is really good. So the six R's are, and right effort is the most, I can't say most, is a real important part of the Eightfold Path because every, every part of the Eightfold Path, and we'll get into that a little bit later, is important. And they, the Eightfold Path is practiced all of the links of depend, or all of the folds of the Eightfold Path occur when you let go of craving. When you relax that tightness that happens around your brain. You're purifying your mind. You're letting go of past mental proliferations. And when you let go of the past mental proliferations, you're clear to see exactly how this process works. And that's what this meditation is all about. Now, a lot of people practice uh, different kinds of, of Buddhist meditation. And they have this idea from a commentary that there's 40 different kinds of meditation. Actually, the Buddha only taught one kind of meditation, the Eightfold Path. There's 40 different objects of meditation, but there's only one method. And that's being confused quite a bit by people that are taking commentaries and making them the same as the Buddha's teaching. And I did that for 20 years. I do understand how that happens. From the very start of my practicing meditation, I was told over and over again that the Visuddhimagga, this commentary, is the Encyclopedia of Meditation. If you have any questions, go look in the Visuddhimagga. After a period of time, I started thinking, well, what happens if I look at the suttas? And I would try to read the suttas, but I didn't understand them because I had this reference of this commentary, and I always went back to that. And it made the suttas incredibly difficult to understand. Now, I was very successful meditation practicer in straight vipassana. But I wasn't satisfied with what they were telling me about it. After doing a two-year retreat, where there was very little distraction in two years. And being successful, they, they told me some things that I couldn't agree with. And they said that I was a Sotapanna, and I, I've always heard that when you become a sotapanna, you'll keep your precepts without breaking them. You might have the temptation to say something that's not true, but as soon as you try, your mind says, no, don't do that. But after they told me that I was a sotapanna, 
I tested whether I could say something that was not true or not and see what my mind did with that. And it didn't slow me down at all. <laughs> so I, I became very disenchanted with straight vipassana. And after doing a retreat for two years, I went back to Malaysia where I had already started up a monastery. And people were very anxious to have me teach them. And they wanted me to teach Vipassana. And I couldn't do it with a clear mind because I knew it wasn't right. And that's when I started teaching loving kindness meditation. When you practice loving kindness meditation, you start changing your perspective of things in life. You don't get so caught up in the emotional roller coasters that you used to get caught up in. There is true personality development when you're practicing the six R's. Your personality starts to soften. You start to notice when you're so incredibly critical of yourself and how you beat yourself up because you did something that maybe was right and maybe it wasn't. But you start seeing that you're causing yourself all of this suffering by this kind of mental proliferation. So you start changing a little bit and you start being softer with your interaction with yourself. Now part of the Eightfold Path is called right speech. And that's always defined as you don't tell any lies, you don't curse, you don't uh, cause problems between one group and another, and you don't gossip. That's right speech, the way they define it. But right speech is having the right speech with yourself. How do you criticize yourself and keep making the same mistakes over and over again? How do you, why do you do that to yourself? Because you're not being mindful in the present moment, or the present, that this is what you're doing. You're developing unwholesome habits. What's an unwholesome habit? Taking these thoughts, this mental proliferation, personally. And beating yourself up. I told some people in Indonesia that I was going to go out and get some boxing gloves so they can really do it right. Because they were so hard on themselves. They were so trying to be perfect with everything. And you're not going to be. And you're going to make mistakes. Good. How do you learn if you don't make mistakes? But don't make the same mistake over and over again. And that's what a lot of people do. They criticize themselves. I'm supposed to be perfect, but I'm not. I did this. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. And then you start mentally beating yourself up. You're craving and clinging and having mental proliferation that causes you suffering more and more. So when you start to recognize that, you have to be softer to yourself. You have to be more forgiving. Okay, you made a mistake. Okay, fine. I forgive myself for not understanding this. And don't do it again. But sometimes you forget and you do it again. Then forgive yourself 
and be more careful with what you're doing in your mind. Be kind to yourself. In the precepts you take every morning, what's the last precept? To be loving and kind to myself and all other beings. To myself. Be forgiving to yourself. And when you're like that, when you start doing that, that's when you actually become a teacher for other people. Because you have balance in your mind. You're not getting caught up in the craving and the clinging and the mental proliferation. So now you can stay in the present moment, in the present, without being hard or critical. See the the Kalama Sutta is a real uh, popular sutta, the first part of it. Oh, you don't believe anything because it's tradition or somebody else says it or whatever. You don't believe it just because it's in the, in the text or because a teacher said it. The advice that the Buddha gave to the Kalamas is if you do or say something that causes pain to yourself or other beings, don't do that anymore. But when you do something or say something that makes you happy and other people around you happy, do that over and over again. So now you're stopping the mental proliferation. You're getting over letting craving dictate your life and you naturally become more happy and joyful. Now this is only the first part of the Kalama Sutta. The other part of the Kalama Sutta is what I'm showing you right now. All of the Brahma Viharas, how to practice loving kindness meditation and compassion and joy and equanimity. And this leads to having a cool mind. There's a sutta in the Mahavaga that says, it, it's a, uh, a sutta called the Fire Sutta. The fire sermon, I think they call it. And the Buddha gave a discourse on how you cause fire in your mind through craving. Craving causes light, and the only way light appears is through heat. Everything's burning. Why? Because of the craving. So I'm trying to show you in this retreat how to cool your mind and have equanimity in it so that there's balance. And you will affect the world around you in a positive way when you practice this way. It really works. It's not a maybe. When you start to understand more and more about how this process works and you start seeing it up close and personal with yourself, you start changing your perspective of the whole world and how you interact with the world. And this is what meditation is for. Now, when I was practicing straight vipassana for almost 20 years, <clears throat> my mind was super critical. You could come up and tell me that your experience in meditation was, and my mind immediately said, you don't know what you're talking about. It's not like that. 
and I was saying things that would really make people unhappy. But when I started practicing loving kindness, that critical nature starts to soften because I'm not being so critical with myself. I'm being more accepting of myself. Now that's what this is talking about. In the present moment, in the past, forgive yourself for past things that you were beating yourself up for. Oh, this is wrong. I shouldn't have done that. Well, can't change it now. It's already done. But you can forgive yourself for not understanding. You can forgive yourself for making a mistake. Uh, I'm in the wrong kind of place to talk about guilt. <laughs> <laughs> But you don't have to feel guilty because you made a mistake. Forgive yourself for making a mistake and learn from that. And that way you can be happy more of the time. You can be at ease with yourself. It's much easier to recognize hindrances when you have an accepting mind of yourself. And then you see this stuff come up and you go, well, that's not mine, that's not me, but it's there. So let's just six R and let it be. It's a real important thing to remember that these hindrances are going to arise and they're there to help you. Yeah, but I don't like. Oh, I don't care. Who doesn't like? I don't. Who's taking it personally? I am. Who's making themselves suffer? I am. So you use the six R's to let go of that false belief in a personal self. And you start seeing things more impersonally. And you don't have that emotional upset that causes so much pain to ourselves. You start having more balance. And you can see this in a number of different suttas that the Buddha is talking about this. It doesn't matter what somebody else says. It doesn't matter whether it's harsh or gentle. It doesn't matter whether it's true or untrue. It just doesn't matter. That's their opinion. They can have that. But I can rate loving kindness to that person. It's a real interesting thing. People think loving kindness. Oh, people are going to take advantage of me if I practice loving kindness. I'll be so kind and so gentle that they'll just keep trying to make me do things that I know I don't want to do. Well, that's not the way it works. When somebody comes up to you with some, something they want you to do and take advantage of you, you start radiating loving kindness to them because that's what they really want. Everybody wants to be loved. Everybody wants to be accepted. So, practice sending loving kindness to everybody you see all day. And you start seeing a change. You want to change the way this government works? Hating it doesn't work. I mean, you have a thing in the daily, or in your morning, uh, Reciting, hatred can never be overcome by hatred. Hatred can only be overcome by love. And it's true. I have people that come to the meditation center and they start squabbling, squabbling with each other. They come knocking at my door. Come in and they're 
angry with each other and they're talking at the same time and they're they're just highly emotional and I see them suffering I see them as really causing each other and themselves pain so what am I going to do I start radiating loving kindness to them I don't say anything I don't get in the middle of their argument I'm not that crazy <laughs> so I start radiating loving kindness and before long they stop talking at the same time and they start discussing what the problem is and they find out really there's not that much of a problem it's pretty easy to take care of and after a while then they start laughing with each other and then they say, I got a lot of things to do. Thanks, Bonte. I'll see you later. And I haven't said a word. I haven't said anything. But I changed the world around me by focusing on loving kindness. I don't care what words they're using. I'm not going to pay attention to that nonsense. And that's what it is. Nonsense. So, Radiate loving kindness to everyone you come up and talk to. And use that person as the reminder to focus on loving kindness to all beings in all directions. Do that with your daily activity. Try just one day of doing that. See what kind of results you get. You'll be shocked. And this takes away the mental proliferation and opinions and false concepts and ideas. People start to get sane. That's what the meditation is about. So a lot of people have this idea that, oh, I'm going to radiate loving kindness to 10 different directions and everybody's going to be happy after that. Actually, it doesn't work that way because they're practicing a one-pointed concentration that is devoted to me. Even though I'm radiating loving kindness, I want the feeling of loving kindness. But they don't want to change their perspective. You have to have this six R's. It has to be there if you want to change the world around you along with yourself. It takes practice, but how much fun is it to Smile to the little kid and have them smile back. It's great fun. In Missouri, sometimes I go into this uh, big store and have to wait in line and one of the little kids is in the cart and they're crying and yelling and not being happy at all. And I start radiating loving kindness to them. And after a short period of time, maybe a minute, maybe a little bit longer, they stop crying and they, they have this look of wonder in their face. What are you doing? Now this is part of generosity, isn't it? This is true generosity. Too many people think that generosity is only about giving material things. And that that's a part of it. But there's no personality development with only giving material things. The personality development is when you can truly love someone in front of you that's suffering. Have compassion. What's the definition of compassion? 
compassion is seeing someone else that's suffering, allowing them to have their pain and love them no matter what. I used to spend a lot of time going to hospital. When I was in Malaysia, I was going about every day because somebody would get some kind of disease and they wanted me to come in and, and hang out with them for a while. So, as I was walking down the hall, I was reminding myself the definition of loving kindness. Their pain is theirs. I can't take their pain away, but I can certainly love them. So when I walk in the room, everybody is down because they're, they're sad because their loved one is suffering. And they're trying to take that pain away and they're making themselves suffer. And many times people will say, when I walk in the, in the room at the hospital, it's like fresh air coming in the room. Because I'm not trying to make their pain go away. All I'm doing is loving them. And they start feeling much better, even though they're in extreme pain. And I always try to say something that makes them laugh. Why? Because the pain starts to go away when you're laughing. The family members, what they do is they come in and they adjust the pillow and adjust the blankets, open the window or close the window or run out and get a glass of water and bring it back. But they're really suffering a lot. So I, when I come in, I'm sending loving kindness not only to the person that's really suffering physical pain, but I'm also radiating loving kindness to the people that are suffering mental pain. And before long, it feels light in the room. I say, okay, I gotta go. You've, you've learned your lesson now. Pay attention and do it. It's really kind of amazing because when I went to, in, in, uh, in Malaysia they have large rooms like this with just beds one after the other after the other. So I'd go in and I'd visit these people and I'd start radiating loving kindness. And then it's time to leave and I start walking away and a Muslim man, Muslims do not like Buddhists. They really don't. But I wasn't being a Buddhist at that time. I was focused on radiating loving kindness, so they'd ask me to come over and they'd hold my hand. Okay, fine. I have no problem with that. I start radiating loving kindness to them. They started feeling better and they very profusely thanked me. But it doesn't matter what their belief system is. If they're human beings and they're suffering, I want to send loving kindness to them. I want to keep that going with my daily activities. When I'm walking from one place to another, I want to radiate loving kindness or equanimity and that affects everybody else around you. So you're helping everyone by doing this. Practice this often. Okay, we're gonna get back to Um, dependent on the body and tangibles, body consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is body contact. With body contact as condition, there is body feeling. 
What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. What one craves, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. What one has mentally proliferated as the source. Perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a man with respect to past, future, and present uh, tangibles cognizable by the body. Dependent on, I forgot where it was. Uh, dependent on mind and mind objects, mind consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is mind contact. With mind contact as condition, there is mind feeling. With mind feeling as condition, excuse me, what one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. What one craves, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates with what one has mentally proliferated as the source. Perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a man with respect to the past, future, and present mind objects cognizable by mind. So it starts to make sense. This is how this process works. And it works the same for all human beings. It doesn't matter what country they come from. It doesn't matter what their culture says. This is how it actually works. When there is the I of form and I consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of eye contact. When there's the manifestation of eye contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of eye feeling. When there's the manifestation of eye feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there is the manifestation of perception, there is, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there's the manifestation of craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. So if you don't catch it right after feeling, and you start getting caught up in your stories and mental proliferations. Use the six R's right then. But don't criticize yourself because you weren't fast enough. Okay? Any kind of critical thought about yourself is unwholesome. And that is a source of suffering. So it's a real important thing to use the six R's so much that it becomes automatic. And it will. It will become automatic over a period of time. Every time you experience the six R's, you are experiencing the third noble truth, the cessation of suffering. You're letting go of the suffering. How much lighter and cooler does your mind become because of that? And this is an all the time practice. This is not just about sitting. It was a real good thing when the Japanese came over to America and they introduced Zen meditation. But one of the things that they did 
was they got across the idea that the only time you can meditate is when you're sitting. And that has kind of hurt people in this country. And when you start thinking about only doing it while you're sitting, that means you don't have to pay attention to what you're doing during the rest of the day. Oh, I feel really good when I sit in meditation. And the rest of the day you're cursing and making people unhappy. Well, that's not the practice. See, I want you to be real familiar with the hindrances when they come up while you're sitting because they're going to come up in your daily life and then you can recognize it and six are right then. <clears throat> and send forgiveness to yourself for getting caught or send loving kindness to other people around you. So this is an all the time practice. That's why I wrote the book Life is meditation, meditation is life. There's no difference. It's something that needs to be done all the time. When I was practicing straight vipassana, the, one of the last things the teacher said was, okay, go out in the world and be mindful. What in the world is that supposed to mean? Well, be mindful of your body they don't understand that the mindfulness of body is mindfulness of the tension and tightness that arises when a hindrance arises or when you start thinking or there's a feeling or a sensation this is part of the body a lot of people don't think that way they think that from here to here is a mind and the body is everything else but it's not true and when they talk about in the suttas they talk about being mindful of the body what they're talking about is being mindful of the tension and tightness in the body and relax and that means six R. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding in Buddhism because of the kind of practices that they are, are using. They're trying to make the Hindu practices fit in to the Buddhist practice. It doesn't work. One-pointed concentration, absorption concentration, takes you on a definite different path where you're going to run into a wall. You're going to run into this place where there's no more progress in your meditation. That will never happen when you're practicing the six R's. Isn't that interesting? You're always going to progress. Why? Because you're always purifying yourself by relaxing and letting go of the craving. And that's one of the things that makes this practice so much fun. Because you keep progressing and you get these insights and you go, wow, that was real. I, I just saw this and that's great. That's what that's talking about. Now you, you see that I'm reading the Buddha's words a lot. They're not mine. It's not my ideas. It's what the Buddha's talking about. And I still get a lot of insights by reading the same sutta. You might hear me read it 50 times. Some of my students that are, are living it Dhammasukha. They hear me give the same suttas over and over again, but they still get insights. Oh, I didn't hear it that way before. Oh, ain't that neat? 
And you feel like you're really progressing when you have these kind of insights. It's really fun. So, this practice is never boring. I've probably read Sutta 111 that I did last night. I've probably read that three or four hundred times. And it's always new. There's always something, there's insights that come to me that, oh, I just thought of this. That's what this is meaning. See how that works. And it comes from doing the same thing over and over again, reading the same suttas over again. Oh, I'm bored. I don't want to hear that. There is a sutta called the Chitraka Sutta that has an amazing amount of repetition in it. It takes me about an, uh, about an hour and five minutes to read it. I do it for every retreat. And a lot of people have heard me do this over and over and over again. And then they'll come in for the interview and they'll say, well, did you like the sutta last night? Yeah, I really heard it this time, and I really do understand it. All right, good for you. It's not easy to read with so much repetition. But why do you think the Buddha has so much repetition in the suttas? So it will get set in your mind. Now when he gave a discourse, his discourses sometimes would last all night because there was so much repetition. And nobody complained about being, it taking so much time. Nobody complained about it at all. Part of our problem right now is we read the suttas. We need to hear the suttas. And hear all of the repetition. And hear it with interest. Uh, Joseph Goldstein just read a, a writ, wrote a, uh, a new book and he said in the book, I'm starting to realize that all this repetition that happens in Buddhism is pretty helpful. And it is. It's amazingly helpful because you hear the same thing one time, you haven't got it. You hear it a second time, you kind of get it. But you hear it three or four or six or eight times then it gets stuck in your mind for a little while. Now when I do the Chachaka Sutta, I tell everybody, I don't want you to talk, I don't want you to move around after reading the Sutta, I want you to meditate. Because all of that repetition, repetition gets caught in your head and you start having it come back out at you when you start seeing things. This is how that works. I highly recommend that you memorize the sutta. Now, one of my students had a, a stroke about 20 years ago, and it affected her memory. When she first came and started practicing with me, she said, I can't remember anything. Well, that's a challenge for me. So, 
I would start repeating things over and over and get her to say them over and over. And before long, she, had, she knew all of the Four Noble Truths. And then she knew the Five Aggregates. And then she really got adventuresome and she memorized the Eightfold Path. And I got her doing this kind of thing over and over and over again. I said, I'd ask her to repeat something. And she'd do it. And I'd say, uh, I thought you didn't have a memory. And she, the Kema is who I'm talking about, Sister Kema. She was driving me around the country so that I could teach in different places. And while I was driving or riding with her, I was getting her to recite all of this different stuff. And she'd do it, and then I'd say, okay, do it again. Okay, do it again. Now do it backwards. Oh, that was tough. But she got so she could do it forwards and backwards, like the five aggregates. That's not much, it's just five things to remember. It took about three hours of going over the same thing over and over and over again before she got it. But once she got it, she still has it to this day. That's what the repetition is all about. You need to have repetition. But we're in the fast food generation. We like things fast. We want it simple and easy. Make it quick. I've had people complain to me, you talk too long. <laughs> Why don't you just talk for about a half an hour? <laughs> well, I got too much to tell you to talk it up for a half an hour. And how much time do you hear me repeating myself? so you can get it stuck in your mind. So you can understand the importance of hearing it over and over again. So there was one instance, we were in California and we had to drive back to Missouri while she was driving. And I told her I wanted her to have the Chichaka Sutta memorized by the time we got back. And she did. And the next year we went to Indonesia, we got in a car accident and she has a very weak back and it gets thrown out very easily and she was really suffering so we went, took her to the hospital and she said, She's laying down on the bed, kind of moaning, and she said, what am I supposed to be doing with my mind? I said, recite the Chichaka Sutta. And she did, and the pain went away, because she wasn't focusing on it. And she was seeing this process that I'm showing you right now. She's seeing this process. This is how this works. And she didn't take it personally. So there's a lot of advantages to memorizing what the Buddha said. Some suttas more than others. But the easiest sutta in, in this whole Majjhima Nikaya to memorize is the Chichaka Sutta because it has so much repetition in it. And you'll see. When there is the manifestation of craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there's the manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of besetment by perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. When there is the ear, a sound, an ear consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of contact. 
When there is the manifestation of contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of feeling. When there's the manifestation of uh, ear feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there's the manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there's a manifestation of craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there's the manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of besetment by perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. When there is the nose and odors and nose consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of nose contact. When there is the manifestation of nose contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of nose feeling. When there is the manifestation of nose feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there's a manifestation of perception, there it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there is a manifestation of craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there's a manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of besetment by perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. When there is the tongue, flavors, and nose consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of nose contact. Tongue contact, excuse me. <clears throat> when there is the manifestation of tongue contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of tongue feeling. When there is the manifestation of tongue feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there is the manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there is the manifestation of craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there is the manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of besetment by perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. When there is the body, a tangible and body consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of body contact. When there is the manifestation of body contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of body feeling. When there is a manifestation of body feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there is the manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there is the manifestation of craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there is the manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of besetment by perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. Okay, I'm going to skip a part of this because it takes too long to explain it. And I've been talking for a long time and we still have a ways to go. Friends, when the Blessed One rose from his seat and went into his dwelling after giving a summary in brief, without expounding the detailed meaning, that is, monks, as to the source through which perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a man, if nothing is found there to delight in, welcome and hold to, this is the end of the underlying tendency to lust, the underlying tendency to aversion, 
the underlying tendency to craving, the underlying tendency to views, the underlying tendency to doubt, the underlying tendency to conceit, the underlying tendency to desire for being, the underlying tendency to ignorance. This is the end of resorting to rods and weapons, of quarrels, brawls, disputes, recrimination, malicious words, quarrels, brawls, uh, false speech. These, here these evil unwholesome states cease without remainder. I understand the detailed meaning of this summary to be thus. Now, friends, if you wish to go to the Blessed One and ask him the meaning of this, as the Blessed One explains it to you, so you should remember it. Here the monks have, then the monks, having delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Mahakachana's words, rose from their seats and went to the Blessed One after paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and told the Blessed One all that had taken place after he had left, adding, The Venerable Sir, then Venerable Sir, we went to the Venerable Mahakachana. Ask him about the meaning of this. The Venerable Mahakachana expounded the meaning uh, to us with these terms, statements, and phrases. Mahakachana is wise, monks. Mahakachana has great wisdom. If you had asked me the meaning of this, I would have explained to you in the same way that Mahakachana has explained it. Such is the meaning of this, and you should remember it. When this was said, the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, just as if a man exhausted and hungry and weak and weakness came upon a honey ball, wherever he would ta taste it, it, he would find its sweet, delectable flavor. So too, Venerable Sir, any able-bodied monk, wherever he might scrutinize with wisdom the meaning of this discourse on the Dhamma, would find satisfaction and confidence of mind, Venerable Sir. What is the name of the, this discourse on the Dhamma? As to that, Ananda, you may remember this discourse on the Dhamma as the honey ball discourse. That is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So this gives you a little bit of um, a taste of the links of dependent origination. It will get more in detail in the next couple of days. There is a book that was written in Sri Lanka by a monk by the name of Jnananda. It's called Concept and Reality. And he took this sutta and made a whole book out of it. And it's absolutely great. It's not entertaining reason, uh, entertaining reading. But every monk that I've ever run across that has read that has high praise for it. He goes into depth and detail that's really remarkable. And is right on. Now we're going to be getting some copies that I can send to you if you want one. But don't look for it being simple reading. It is deep. But it is definitely worth it. <clears throat> 
So you can write an email to David and say you want a copy of the book and we'll send it as soon as we get them. Okay, so you can write to him right now, and when we get back, we'll send it to you. When I was in Sri Lanka, they donated some money to me after I gave a retreat, but it was all in Sri Lankan. And they don't trade Sri Lankan uh, uh, money into American money unless you go through a big hassle. So what I did was I took that money and had 500 copies of this book because I'd already written to him and I asked him if we could have 250 copies. And then I went to visit him. He's, he's an old monk, he's, he's on his last legs. He's about 85 and he only has about a quarter of his lung capacity. And I said, Venerable Sir, I ask permission to be able to print copies of this book. And he said, no. And I said, why? He said, because in America, people are selling this book and it's supposed to be for free distribution. And he said, there's somebody, someplace in uh, America, this Dhammasukha Meditation Center that, that wants 250 copies of it. And I said, yeah, that's me. <laughs> But he wouldn't give me permission. So even though it is online, I couldn't take it offline and print it because he has to give me permission. Well, I started sending other monks to him asking if I could have permission to have some copies made because I'm going, only going to be giving them away. I'm not charging anything. And finally, he said yes. But it had to be printed by his printer. So I had to have it all printed in Sri Lanka, which is great, except they get so little, uh, they, they have one container that they put everything that's going into other countries in and they only mail it every six months. And it takes three months to get it to America. So we're still waiting. Eventually we will have all of those copies. And we have a page dedicated to Nanananda. Yes. The website. It's, got all, it's got the thing online too. So, and all his talks recorded uh, in audio. You have to get kind of used to his... Uh, he has good English, but his English is Sri Lankan English. So you have to get used to the way he pronounces things. For me, it's not a problem because I was in Asia for 12 years and I, I got to pick up all different countries in the way that they say things. So I can understand very easily. But you might have to listen for a little <coughs> while before you start picking it up. It's definitely worth it. He's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. <coughs> he wrote that as his thesis for his doctorate. And then he got sick. And when he started to get healthy again, he wanted to submit that as his thesis. But two other monks had taken up the same uh, the same topic. So they said no. So he had to write another thesis to get his PhD. But he saved it. He saved what he wrote in concept and reality. And he was carrying it around with him for 12 or 14 years until he went to the island Hermitage where uh, Jnanaponika was. 
and Jnana, he gave it to Jnanapanika to read. Jnanapanika is a very famous German monk in Sri Lanka, and he started up the Buddhist Publication Society. And as soon as he read that, he said, we got to print this up. You, you got to start giving this away. This is really, it's so much better than anything else that's been written. And it is absolutely outside of the suttas, one of the best Dhamma books I've ever read. And he wrote another one about, what is it, magic? Yeah, magic and the illusions of the mind or something like that. And what he did was he went to the Angutra Nikaya and he found a sutta that was one sentence long and wrote a whole book on it. And it's great. It's really good. So we'll try to make all of that stuff available at some point. I think what we're going to do is start a fund where if you want to donate to have books given away for free, that you'll be able to donate and then we'll put your name in the book and that sort of thing. That's what they did in, in uh, Malaysia. And all the books, in, Dhamma books in Malaysia, they're all for free. And it's just great. You can get all kinds of really interesting topics and ideas from the books that, that they print for free. So I kind of like to start that tradition in this country. Anyway, you've heard me talk for a lot. Do you have any questions? Yeah. When um, Yanananda talks about preparations, it really throws me off. What does he mean when he uses the term preparations? I don't remember. Formations. <laughs> formations. Okay, formations. But he 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 it's calls. A language it, thing. Yeah, it, it is a language thing. But it's formations. Yeah. But also, uh, it's been a few years since I've read it, so I'm going to have to go back and read it if I'm going to advertise it. <laughs> yes? So really, I, you said something early on, and then I think you clarified it, but I just wanted to say it again to hear it again. Anytime we take something personal, it would be the six R. Yes. Why? Because that's the start of the false belief in a personal self. Yeah. Well, that's the, f the start of the false belief in a personal self. And as we go on more in depth with the links of dependent origination, I'm going to show you how every link has the Four Noble Truths in it. And the three characteristics. And this description of this process, it depends on one thing coming up, and then on that, when that came up, it depends on this coming up, and that's why it's called dependent origination. When you get to a place where you have the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness at that time, you're experiencing still mundane Nibbana, where there are no more conditions arising at that time, but they will start up again until you become an Arahat, then you got no more problems. Why don't we share some merit? <coughs> <coughs> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. 
May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddhist dispensation. Thank you.